Let me pray. <laughs> Let me pray. Let's get started. Father, we just thank you and pray, Lord, that you would speak. And Lord, that I would stay out of the way. And Lord, that you would just speak clearly today. So we thank you. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. So, this is coming off. Okay. Um, today is actually the beginning of the last vision. So we, we came into this book and we got through the first half, the first six chapters. And, you know, it was relatively straightforward. But then these last few chapters have been kind of strange. A little bit difficult. Um, last week we did the 77s, right? Um, very unusual passages, and now we're in the last vision. And so this last vision is actually going to carry through three chapters. So it starts here, and it's going to finish in chapter 12. And that's the end of the book, okay? Um, there is going to be a bit of a break. Um, as I've been announcing, we do have a joint service next Sunday, so don't come here next Sunday at 1 o'clock because it will be empty. <laughs> we are going to be with the main, chur main church for the 12 p.m. service. Um, I'll announce that again. Um, but we will be taking a break before we finish up in the next two weeks, okay? So with that, the question I wanted to ask was, you know, in our relationship with God, in, in the many times that we've prayed to Him, in the many times that we've just sought after God, have you ever received what you felt was a tangible response? Have you ever, like, it's different for everybody. Like, for some people, they feel that God actually speaks Know, speaks to them directly. So some people will say they heard the voice of God speaking to them. Others will say they felt an impression. Right? They, felt they, they had a, an emotional feeling. So I, when, I, when I ask the question, a couple of you guys nod your heads. right? Um, and some people see visions, some people will see dreams. It's different for every one of us, honestly. For my own self, God has tended to speak to me more in... I guess in Korean it would be like Nukim. Um, but but it, it's more about just a conviction. And, and I'll just know. right? I just know that this is what God is, is telling me to do. And there, there's been times also where I, I just felt this warm presence. Um, there's a time I was going through a very difficult season. And I felt like I should have received judgment. I should have received something harsh. Because that's what I was getting from other people. But... Every time I came to God, all I just felt was love. Just no other way to describe it. I just felt like I was in His embrace. And so for myself, I've had these experiences where God has tangibly responded to me. I think some of you have had it in this room as well. The passage we're going to read today, it's going to be a response. It's going to be a very different response. A response that probably no one in this room will ever receive. Um, but with that, let's get to Daniel 10. Open up your Bibles, smartphones, or look at the screen above. Daniel 10, starting with verse 1. Okay. Word of the Lord says this. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat, or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. I can't use those lotions. All right. <laughs> Sounds like someone. Anyway. <laughs> on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Ufaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleaming, or like the gleams of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you, and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And, and when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. 
But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and, and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to, flight, uh, to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, the prince. Okay, probably wondering what you just read. Alright, um, so again, you know, we're coming toward the end of Daniel. Um, you know, if, if you look at the first six chapters, we learned a lot through the things that happened in his life. Challenges to be holy. Challenges to, to seek prayer from others. Challenges to stand firm in our faith. And to be that faithful and humble witness. And to trust and to pray. And then as we got into his visions, in the, in the second part of, of the book, you know, it, it starts with, 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 with the, the vision of the Son of Man coming, one like a Son of Man, who we know to be Jesus. And for us to put our hope in him, and to also trust in him even during difficult times. And last week we talked about the 77s, and, and where with the 77s, Daniel, who honestly is a very holy man, was being challenged to be even holier. And so in that same way, we're challenged to continue to seek growth. And as we seek growth, he can grow us even more than we could imagine. So, as I've reminded you for many weeks now, God reigns. This is the theme of the book of Daniel. And again, even during this latter half, he's continuing to show us that he reigns. And as I mentioned before, this final vision that we're getting into is, is split over the next three chapters. And this is the first part of that, of that last vision. So, a little bit of background, because right away it tells us where, when this was written. This was written during the third year of King Cyrus. Okay? Um, the previous chapter was under Darius the Mede. Now, Cyrus is, is a very well-known um, figure historically. He was the guy who founded the, the Achaemenid dynasty, which was that Medo persian Empire. Um, they were the ones that defeated the Babylonians. This guy, he was honestly revolutionary for his time. Um, he was actually very much about just creating an empire where it was actually beneficial to be a member. Right? In the Babylon Empire, sure it was great, but at the same time, if you weren't a Babylonian, you are kind of on the outside. But with the Persians, he changed things up. He made things very well administrated. Um, he made it actually financially beneficial for you to be part of the Persian Empire. That's why it grew even larger than the Babylonians. And he was such an inspiration that not only Alexander the Great, but Thomas Jefferson looked up to this guy. Thomas Jefferson is kind of a weird guy, <laughs> but regardless, he was a hero to many people. And even the Bible itself, in Isaiah 45, 1, calls Cyrus his anointed one. Some will say that Cyrus is the only Gentile in the entire Old Testament that's called the Messiah, basically. So he's a, this, is, this guy's legit. And this is the third year of his reign. Now, why is Cyrus important? Remember, last, last week we talked about there was a year of 70 years of exile, or there was a prophecy of 70 years of exile. So Jeremiah had told the people of Israel, for 70 years you will be exiled in Babylon, and then you will be set free. Now I kind of misspoke before when I said Darius the Great was the one that actually set them free. Technically it was Cyrus, because Cyrus was the first one to write an edict. So he wrote this decree that said, okay Jews, you can go back home, and you can you know what? go back home and rebuild your temple. 
This is one of the ways this guy was revolutionary. <coughs> no one did that back then. What ruler took over a people group and said, hey, you can be yourselves again. <laughs> back then, if you took over another group of people, they had to become like you. And so, you study history, and this guy just doesn't make any sense. Honestly, when I was studying my intro to Western Civ class, um, back when I was in college, and I know the Yonsei students are like, oh, I see you. It's funny, because they hate the class, but then every time I talk about the stuff, they're like, hey, I learned about that. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, with West Civ, the, one of the, like, when, the thing is, the reason, one of the reasons why I love history is when you study the history of the world, if you just study it without God, it makes no sense. You look at it, and you're like, 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 why are these people great? Like, how did these people that were great disappear? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, honestly, like, like I've talked about this before. The Romans, there wasn't anything special about them. Why were they better than the Greeks? It's, it's kind of like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Like, why is Microsoft, you know, why did it grow so much when, when Bill Gates didn't come up with any ideas? He just stole from other people, right? <laughs> Apple, you know, they're innovators. Steve Jobs is an innovator, right? Oh, whatever it might be. It doesn't make any sense if you don't put God into the lens. But the moment you put God into the lens of this, God has, was the one who said, I will set you free. Even though history says Cyrus did it, and even though history, like, Cyrus himself was a very unique man in history, at the end of the day, if you realize that this is what God wanted, that's why it happened. It wasn't just because this guy came up with a cool idea. It was the desire of God. Further still, you know, you look at, you look at Rome, um, and you look at, at how Rome came to power and then quickly disappeared in many ways. Everyone thought Rome was going to last forever. And then all of a sudden, these like you know these Germanic barbarians came and took it over, right? Um, and, and the thing is, if, if you look at it from the lens of Christianity, honestly, one of the reasons I feel Rome actually existed for that long was for the propagation of Christianity. It created safe roads, created transportation for something like a religion to spread rapidly. Anyway, I'm going way off tangent. Okay, so Edict of Cyrus. Cyrus says, all right, Jews, go home. Go, go, go rebuild your temple. Go, go worship your God. This is cited in the Bible twice, in 2 Chronicles and in the book of Ezra. Now they go back. And this is during the first year of Cyrus's reign. Remember, we're reading in the third year. So this is two years later. So in the first year, he says, go back home. So people go back home. Everybody's happy. Yay, we get to go back to Jerusalem. Yay, we get to rebuild a temple. They get there, and then these other people say, wait a minute. No, no, you can't do this. And so they get resistance. There are these outsiders that, that actually fight against them and get them to stop working. So much so that the Jews are like, okay, forget it. Like, they end up, they're in Jerusalem. And they're not working on the temple. Um, if you guys remember, I spoke from the book of Haggai during my first year here. That was 16 years later. So basically, they show up. They get to the temple, and they're like, yeah, they start building. People come and say, no, you can't do this. So okay. And they start building their own houses. Um, and God starts yelling at us, why are you building your own houses when my house is left unbuilt? 16 years went by. This is the book of Haggai. And then later we see in Ezra 6, Darius comes back. This is two kings later. So there was Cyrus, Xerxes, and then Darius. Finally, something like 20 years later, Darius says, okay. You know, Cyrus said it was okay 20 years ago, so it's okay. So he reconfirms it. That's why Darius is usually given credit for freeing the Israelites, but actually technically it was Cyrus. Okay? Sorry for going around all that, but you need to know this information. So, the other thing to note, it gave us a specific date. The specific date, I think it was like, what, the 24th day of the first month, something like that. This was actually right in between Passover and the Feast of, um, Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this would have been the time of the year when all the Jews were honoring their liberation, their freedom from Egypt. Okay? So keep this in mind. This is the time of the year where, where Israelites would, would celebrate the freedom they got from God, you know, hundreds of years before. And this is also two years after they went to Jerusalem and stopped working. Right? So because of this, this is why Daniel is fasting so much, not even putting on lotion. 
Right? <laughs> he said, I'm not going to put on lotion because i got to pray into this. Because for him, he knows that Jews have gone back to Jerusalem, but they're not doing anything. It's been two years. And it's the time of the year when God, when they're honoring the time God set them free long, long ago. And so Daniel is fasting. And he's praying. He's not eating food. He's intensely praying. And as I shared before about fasting, fasting honestly is... Um, I've always enjoyed fasting because it puts you what, it, what I call in a posture of prayer. You know, it's not... Honestly, people like to look at fasting as Christian dieting. It's not that. Um, it, it's, it's actually, you're not just foregoing food. That time you would normally eat, you're supposed to spend in prayer. right? And for me, what I found when I fast is, first off, I find out that I'm able to supernaturally get through the day. Because to me, as I've shared before, if I don't eat, I'm very cranky. I'm almost unfunctional. right? But for whatever reason, when I, when I tell myself, okay, I'm going to fast, all of a sudden, my body stops complaining. Now, it does some weird things. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's just normal. But, but at the same time, like I find that I have much more energy than I would expect. And this is even when I fast for long periods of time. But the thing I enjoy the most about that is because I feel this supernatural like nourishment that actually encourages me and helps me in my time of prayer. So in the same way, Daniel is intensely fasting. And he's, he's really seeking God because, remember last week, he was meditating on the fact that they were going to be set free. They have already been set free. A couple of years have passed, and what he was meditating on last chapter has happened. But even though they're free, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. The temple is not being rebuilt. And so Daniel, he's like, what's going on? And he's fasting and he's praying. He's, praying. he's probably... Asking God, God, make something happen. And in that sense, God responds. If you, if you look at the passage and, and you look at, at, at what this, this person says to him, he says, we heard you. We heard you in the heavens. We heard what you were saying. We heard your words. And we've come here in response. So if there's anything I want you to get out of this message today, it's that like God hears you. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that so much that we don't even say anything to God. Because we already assume, okay, God obviously doesn't care. Or like, God's not listening. And so, for, for some of us, we don't even bother saying anything. But what this passage clearly tells us, when we intensely go to God into prayer, He hears us. And He desires to respond. Now, who is this man? This man comes. This man in linen. Okay? Now this is a very, there's a lot of debate over who this man is. There's one side that says, well, he's, he's an angel. Right? He just doesn't have a name. And then there's the other side that says, isn't this Jesus? Now, here's the reason why. Um, when you look at the description that's given him, like, you know, this, this belt of gold from Ufas and like, you know, burnished bronze, was it arms or something like that? Um, if you compare that to other passages in Ezekiel and Revelation, these are known passages that are talking about both God and Jesus. And honestly, it's very similar. They're not exact, but it's very similar. And really, in previous passages, Daniel has told you who came to him. He talked about Gabriel. Right? He said, yeah, Gabriel came. But you notice very mysteriously in this chapter, he makes no effort to tell you who this person is. He doesn't even bother. He just says, yeah, this man in linen shows up. So brothers and sisters, even though there are many people that would disagree with me, I come from the camp that says, this is Jesus. And for those of you that have gone through our, our Bible study on Christ in the Old Testament in the past, this is one of many times that Jesus has shown up in the Old Testament. Right? It's not uncommon. For some people, it's like, no, Jesus is New Testament. What are you talking about? No, I would, I would argue with you that he has shown up so many times in the Old Testament if you actually study. As Jesus says, before time, he was. Before creation, he was. 
It was always there. So in my personal opinion, this is Jesus. Jesus showed up. And if you actually really look, and, and you know, honestly, I wasn't expecting this, but as we went through the book of Daniel, Jesus shows up, in, in my count, five times. The first time was what? Uh, as the fourth man? Or no? Yeah. Actually, the no, first time was he was the, the rock. The rock formed not by human hands in chapter 2. Chapter 3, he, he shows up as, as the fourth man in the, in the furnace. Then he shows up again, um, what is it, as, as like a son of man, right? Um, he shows up here, and he also showed up... Oh, why am I drawing a blank? <laughs> um, anointed one, last chapter, Daniel 9, right? So there are five appearances of Jesus just in this book alone. That's kind of crazy. That's like every other chapter of Jesus. Like not just uh, like not not just like uh, like a very indirect message of Jesus. No, it's 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 Jesus either showing up or they're talking about him coming in the future. That's pretty crazy, right? And so this is what happens. In response to the intense prayer of Daniel, Jesus shows up. And you see that Daniel, as I talked about before, he's, he's like one of the holiest people in the entire Old Testament. You can't find anything wrong with this guy. And then you see at what happens to him when Jesus shows up, he can't do anything. He like passes out. Right? He's like, <laughs> he falls asleep. And just like, hey, get up, get up. He wakes up and says, Oh, I can't talk. And so like Jesus touches his lips and then all of a sudden words start coming out. And then he's like, he's still not strong enough. And so Jesus gives him more power again. Right? This is what happened when Jesus shows up. You get wrecked. Okay? I don't care who you are, you get wrecked. Now, honestly, if it was anyone less holy than Daniel, man. <laughs> like, I don't think Jesus could like, he's like, Really? You're just going to sleep? <laughs> like, come on, hello. <laughs> so that, that's the thing. is This is what happens in the presence of Jesus. But what I want to remind you again is that God listens and God responds. Daniel has this very unique, amazing encounter with the Son of God. And God can respond to us in a very similar way. For most of us, I don't think we want Jesus to show because I don't think we can handle it. But Jesus gives us what we can handle. And he not only does He give us what we can handle, He strengthens us and encourages us. I thought that's what this passage shows us. And so if you see in this passage, there's three times when, when Jesus touches Daniel and restores him. Three times, and he's given him strength in this passage alone. That's the heart of God. Not only does he want to respond to us, not only does he want to, to speak to us and to encourage us, there's that intimacy, physical touch, strengthening that happens, right? Forget to that. And so. That, that's, that's one of the things I, I want us to really key in on is that this man who is never identified, one of the things that is clear throughout the entire chapter is it keeps emphasizing his humanity. One who looks like a man, who keeps touching him, who speaks to him like a man. This is, a, a, in many ways, a, a, a clear sneak preview of Jesus to come. That when Jesus will arrive, Jesus will come as a man. He will be God incarnate. There was always that desire for God to have that intimate connection and relationship with us. And Daniel gets a sneak preview of it right here. So one of the things I want to remind you that I think this passage speaks very clearly is that God is personal. God desires personal contact, personal connection and relationship with His people. And God desires that intimacy. He wants us to feel His embrace. He wants us to feel His touch. And through that, to encourage us, to strengthen us. 
like I said before, that, that time when I felt that I was literally in, in the embrace of God, that was the most comforting and most encouraging moment I, I could have experienced. That's the heart of God. Now at the same time, as this man starts to speak and he starts talking about the prince of Persia and all these different things, it's very clear he's not talking literally about what's going on. Right? It's like these princes are, are spiritual beings in many ways. Because he starts talking about Michael. I'll get to Michael in a second. And Michael is identified as another prince. But one of the clear things that, that he's revealing is that there's a different type of warfare that is going on that is unseen. Whoever this prince is that, with, that, that kept them for 21 days, whoever that was, there was some battling going on. And brothers and sisters, this is very much as real today as it was back then. Spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual warfare happens on a daily basis, whether we know it or not. Now, who is this Michael guy? Most, most of you, I think, would know Michael as Archangel Michael. And obviously it's because he's identified as that in the New Testament. Here in the book of Daniel, later on in chapter 12, he's identified as the great prince who protects your people. Michael is known as the great protector, the great defender. He's the one that actually threw Satan out. Right? He's the one who confronted Satan and actually defeated Satan. You know, when you get into the story of how Satan used to be one of the angels that was cast out. Michael is powerful. Archangel? You guys know what Ark means? You guys know Greek? Ark, Arche? Arkos? It means first or chief. Right? So Archangel would literally mean like the chief angel, basically. So it's the highest angel. And so Michael is one of the only angels identified in the Bible, him and Gabriel. Gabriel we've already talked about. Gabriel was the messenger angel. Michael, he's our bodyguard. <laughs> Michael is on our side. And Michael is, the, he's, Daniel's going to keep, keep hearing about Michael throughout this chapter. So what's going on is, this man in linen, who I'm identifying as Jesus, starts to talk about this warfare that's going on, and how there's this defender. We have this man, Michael, this great prince, who's on our side. Nothing has changed. There's still warfare, and I, I don't want to get too into specifics, because honestly, this is an area that I'm not that well versed in. But there are different spiritual forces. But praise God, we got Michael on our side. He's not the only one. But I think what, what, what really comes forward, what speaks to me the most through this chapter, is what is said in verse 19. When the man in linen says, Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. Peace. Be strong now. Be strong. This one message carries a lot of echoes from other similar messages. I think of Joshua 1, where it says, Be strong and courageous. Um, peace is a very common greeting. right? Shalom. Right? That's, that's the greeting that you say. You, you say it and you say it like it's, it's like your hello and your goodbye in, in Hebrew. But literally means peace. Right? These are the words, in my opinion, of Jesus speaking to Daniel. But in the same way, it's, it's the words I feel he wants to speak to us all the time. Jesus doesn't want us to be afraid. Jesus doesn't want us to be anxious. Jesus wants us to be encouraged. He wants us to be strengthened. He wants to strengthen us. And He wants us to feel peace in that place. To me, this is the main thing, the main verse that I like to look at in this chapter because to me, this is the message that I think speaks to all of us. No matter what position we're in, no matter what difficulties we're going through, Daniel is stressed out because he's like, these Jews, they're not doing their job. What's going on? You know, I was contending for this so long, and it happened, and now nothing's going on. He's just frustrated. And God says to him, peace. Be strong. 
Peace of love. <laughs> so that that's this is this is what I want you to get from this is first off that when we speak to God, when we pray to God, He hears us and He desires to respond. And the response that I think He wants us to hear most of the time is for us to be encouraged us to feel peace. Honestly, peace for me has always been one of the best markers to know whether I am standing in the presence of God. Whenever people ask me, like, oh, I don't know what to do with my life, I don't know what to do, like, should I do this, should I do that? Well, whatever I tell them is, just, first off, get in a good relationship with God, make sure that's your first priority, and as you grow in your relationship with God, He will give you peace over what is true. If you choose this thing and then all of a sudden you're, you're filled, with, uh, filled with a sense of peace, it's probably the right decision. Honestly, that's how I, end up, I ended up here at Namzo. Was Honestly, I didn't want to come here. And, and I was kind of kicking and screaming. And then I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And as the process went, I was just filled with more and more peace to the point where I knew this is where God desired me to be. Some of you might have been like, you, you're wrong. <laughs> Regardless. Um, peace. Peace is always a sign of, of whether we are walking in the way of God. And it's only something we know when we're in a strong relationship. And in that same way, He gives us courage and strength to do things that we didn't think were capable. So the main thing I want you to get from this passage, the main thing, God hears you. Praise God. He listens. Right? It doesn't matter how we speak to Him. It doesn't matter even how often. He hears us. Now for those of you that are like feeling a little guilty, like, oh, I should probably pray a little bit more. If that's a conviction you're feeling, yeah, you're probably right. You probably should pray some more. Because <laughs> if you don't pray, how can He hear you? Right? Honestly, just very logically speaking. If we're not spending that time with Him to actually engage with Him, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because I'm, I'm, I struggle with this as well. So if this is an area of weakness for us, then let's make it a strength. Speak to Him because He listens. And believe it or not, He will respond as I mentioned before, there's that strong emphasis on the humanity of this being. God desires that same intimacy and closeness with us, as if you were present in this room right now. And in the same way, if God is responding to us, are we actually listening to Him? Right? God might be responding this whole time. And there's been illustrations about that. There's that famous illustration of the person who's like, like there's like a flood coming, and then um, they're they're in their house, and like the police comes and tells them to leave, and they're like no 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 I'm waiting for God, and then they end up on the roof, and and this like this boat comes, and then they're like oh no no I'm waiting for God, this helicopter comes, and then they, they drown and die, right? And they're like oh where were you? I was like well I sent a policeman, a boat, and a helicopter, like what the heck? <laughs> it's a fam famous illustration, but in the same way. Are we listening? Like, a lot of times we kind of have a desired response. And that's the only thing we're listening for. It's like selective listening. We're like, okay, God can only answer me in this way, so if I don't hear this, then it's not God. It's not true. And so first, speak to God because He hears you. But also, make sure you're listening. Now granted, if God shows up to you, you know, this man in Lynn, and you like, you're, you're off the ground, and like, you can't do, okay, obviously, you can't do anything but listen. But that's not always how he speaks to us. So that's, that's one of the things I want you to think. First off, are you speaking, are you praying to God? And secondly, are you listening for his response? So I've, I've kept this as if, as if he reigns thing going on, so now we're going to listen as if probably should have said, well, I already said pray as if you're in, so I'm, I'm assuming you're praying. <laughs> so now as you pray, listen as if you're in. Listen to his response. 
Be encouraged by it. Peace. Be strong. Let's take a moment to pray. And uh, we'll go ahead and close for today. Um, let's just take a moment first to listen. So you already probably have certain things in your mind that, that are, are requests that you put before God. Um, but I, I just want you to take a moment to just listen and to know, you know, is has God already responded and I just didn't hear him? So let's take the time to just listen, sitting in his presence and hearing from him right now. Let's take that time to listen.